Worship. celebration this morning is hymn number 127. Please stand as you are able and join us in singing.
as we unite in the historic confession of the Christian Church. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Take a moment to prepare our hearts for prayer. lives, O oh God, we have men and women who point us in the right direction. Just like a road map might point us, at least help us map out a way to go, and as we journey from point A to point B, there are signs alongside the road and things, O oh God, that help us identify speed limits and things like uh, rest areas and pit stops and exits. We thank you that these people have pointed us in the right direction. And we, O oh God, come as people, as a family of God, who submit to your guidance. And whether it is through other people, whether it's through our experiences, whether it's through the still small voice or the clap of thunder, we know, O oh God, that you promise to reveal yourself. You may not always explain, but you never promised to explain. You did, O oh God, promise to reveal. And so may these signs, may these opportunities that we have in the midst of our unknowing about tomorrow or our regrets of the past, we pray that they will help us recognize you in our midst. And as we do that together corporately, let us, O oh God, welcome your Holy Spirit whose power will take the ordinary and make it extraordinary. You will take ordinary things to remind us of that extraordinary truth of your gospel. And so, God, we ask that in this never again to be replicated moment, through the power of your Holy Spirit in the name of your Son, who taught his disciples to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
Let us now worship God with his tithes and our offerings. Let us pray. Receive these, O God, your tithes and our offerings and allow them to be multiplied within this church so that we may be able to further your kingdom and hasten your return. It's in your son's precious name we pray. Amen. remain standing as we read our scripture passage today from Philemon verses 8 through 18. Accordingly, through, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what, I, what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to per appeal to you, I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner, also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. And I'm sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during in my imprisonment for the gospel. But I prefer to do nothing without your consent, in order that your goodness might not be a compulsion, but of your own accord. For this perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while, that, I might, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bond servant, but more than a bond servant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So, if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. And if he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. 
This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And may the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Welcome you once again to our worship services. There is a red pew pad. Those who are worshiping online, don't look around. You don't have one. But there is one right here. And if you would pass it down, pass it back again, and register your attendance and greet those around you. And as you do, I invite the children to come forward for our children's message. I am, and I'm like really tall, aren't I? So it uh, makes me feel just like, wow. So uh, um, when y'all get up in the morning, how do y'all get up? Early. You get up early? <laughs> What's that? You like getting up late? Well, uh, you, you, you wake your mom and dad up? What? Your parents get you up? Yeah, you kind of get a free pass on the, on the weekend, right? I know it's early, isn't it? Well, do uh, uh, well, you know what? I don't have my parents come help me wake up, and uh, because I'm an adult, that's right. Yeah, you know, maybe maybe I should call my parents to come and get me up. Huh? Yeah, I am a parent, so I sometimes I have to get my children up. But uh, oh, listen. Hear that? That was my alarm. Did you hear that? I just pressed the snooze button. Do you know what the snooze button is? <laughs> What's the snooze button do? Yeah, so if the alarm goes off and you hear it, you can press the snooze button and it sort of quits. But look at all the alarms that I have set on my phone. <laughs> What's those time? Reynolds? Okay. How many? Yeah, count them. It's a lot of alarms, isn't it, Ten. Well, let's just focus in on, like on, like on Sunday mornings, uh, I have an alarm that goes off at 520, and then if I press the snooze button, I have one that goes off at 530, and then if I'm really in trouble, I have one that goes off at 6, and then 615, and then 630, what's, what's it, 645, 7, now if I, listen, if I made it, if I, if I pressed the snooze button that many times and I, I didn't get up till 7, I'd probably be in trouble. But then 7.30, I'd really be in trouble, right? 8.30, I would, be in, I would probably be in trouble with some parents because you know what starts at 8? I'd get kicked out. Well, yeah, because you know what happens at 8.30? We have a service. And could you imagine if the service started and I was still in bed? That would be bad, wouldn't it? So I have all these alarms to make sure that I wake up in time. Is there some, is there one in the second Well, maybe not 12. I hope I'm, I hope I'm yeah, really asleep by 12. I got a lot of them, don't I? Yeah, I do. Why do you have two eight o'clock? Well, that one is, uh, um, I'm not sure why that one was there. I bet I made a mistake. I should delete it, right? But now all these, er, I have some, I have a bunch in the mornings. And because and, I need him to help me wake up. And in fact, if John could have me my Bible that I forgot. Did you know that the New Testament talks about alarms? Did you know that? Yeah. It did. 
And I, I bet you were saying, Reynolds, you were probably going to say that it shows up in the book of Romans, right? <laughs> Romans chapter 11, 13, verse 11 says, Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come to wake up from sleep. I never You didn't know that? Well, I'll tell you. In, in, if, you know, in the Greek, that means you've got to set your alarm clock. Oh. Yeah, exactly right. That's exactly right. <laughs> Not on your phone, okay? Well, you probably don't have a phone just yet, but, but, <laughs> you have a phone? Okay, all right. Well, sometimes an alarm clock's very helpful because it can help us wake up. Now, this is my phone. <laughs> yeah, it does. It helps us to wake up. And, and Paul, who writes to the church at Rome, what he's saying is really not to use an alarm clock. But he's saying pretend you have an alarm clock in life because there's sometimes we need to wake up on the things that are going on around us and we don't need to be asleep. Because if we're asleep, guess what will happen? We'll miss it. Have you, ever, have you ever been watching a movie and you're really tired and you want to watch the end of it and then you fall asleep? Does that happen? No, that never happens. That never happens? Okay, all right. Okay, that's a bad example. Wasn't it? <laughs> well, I tell you what. Okay, well, let's not talk about that. Yeah, all right, so, all right, so, well, let me let me ask you this. There's a there's, there'll be a football game that comes on tonight. Yeah. And it's, it'll come on kind of late, and I bet you fall asleep in it. No, I'm not. I'm not. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. So y'all had a bunch of chocolate this morning, didn't you? So, all right, tell you what, let, let's pray here. Let's pray. Okay, all right. Hey, back to me. You ready? All right, so let's pray that we won't need our alarm clock in life. Okay? You think you can do that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Shh. Let's, let's, let's pray. It's not going to be, I'm never going to make it. All right, so, yeah, thank you. All right, do me a favor. All right, close your eyes. You ready? All right, let's pray. Oh God, what we pray, Lord, is uh, one, we give thanks for your love and your mercy, and we give thanks for an opportunity to come together and worship. And what we really hope, Lord, is that uh, in life, particularly where you're active in our life and where you're active in the world, we don't want to miss that. And so we don't, we don't, we hope that we don't need an alarm clock for that. But just in case we do, send those reminders to us so that we can see your love and your mercy that. It is so active in the world. See it in our own lives. See it in the, in the lives of the people that are around us. Uh, and for all this, we give thanks. What I pray, Lord, is that you would bless these who sit with me, that you, you would watch over them, continue to, to, to guide them in every way imaginable as they're growing physically and mentally and emotionally, uh, relationally, we want them to grow spiritually, which means, God, that we want them to to be anchored in a, a, an understanding of your love for them and for that to be so dominant in their life that, that it dictates how they see themselves and, and how they see the world and how they interact uh, with it. So b bless them, O oh God, we pray. And we pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Good luck, Donna. <laughs> John uh, just said you got hijacked, and that was right. Uh, had someone ask me uh, um, about when it rains and it's cold on a Sunday morning, what happens? I said, well, our online attendance goes up. <laughs> so uh, for those that brave the elements, thank you. Glad that you're here. If you would, please bow your heads with me. Oh, God, as we transition now and... Uh, into a, a, a different aspect of worship where we want to be guided by the text that was read for us. What we always hope is that it would be leveraged in such a way uh, that what we experience is the gospel. Uh, we acknowledge that the gospel is something that takes place outside of us, but through the work of your spirit, uh, you're able to implant that deep into the depths of our soul, our being. 
And so we pray for that again. And what we pray, Lord, is that uh, you would use this time in such a way that what's created is the nature uh, of Christ inside of us. And so even if that's to the smallest of degrees this morning, we, we still are open to that. And we pray for this in the name of Christ. Amen. Now, over the last few weeks, both on Sunday mornings and on Wednesday nights, we've, uh, we're, we're under this canopy of what we're calling Big Faith One Thing. And, and the idea is to take an honest, reflective look at our life and to acknowledge those things that, that might be a part of our life that either we have tried to change, either about who we are or, or how we act, and, and have either been unsuccessful or those things that we know are a part of our life that where we practice this passive sense of denial. They're there, we know that they're there, uh, but we just hope and pray that they're, they just sort of sit in the background and it's not something that uh, really is, is dominant or, or influential inside of our life. It, we just practice a sense of, of denial. And the goal over uh, these sermons and in our time on Wednesday night is to invite God into uh, fully into vetting our life in, in such a way that uh, as we look at these one, this one thing or, or things in general about us that we want to change, that through the work of the Spirit, that will either begin the process of change or it will continue that process so that what's created is this maturation of faith. What's created is uh, the nature of Christ inside of us. Uh, and some have shared uh, throughout this process since the beginning of the year that of what their one, what their one thing is. Uh, it might be um, greater accountability in their life. Uh, some have expressed what they're, they're hoping is for greater intimacy uh, with God in their life, and, and that's going to be their direction for this year to come. Um, some of you that are involved in our social uh, uh, social media ministries where we send out either videos or, or emails or devotionals, uh, we've shared from uh, part of our staff members. And, and they've, they've expressed of, of where they've going th have went through this uh, uh, discernment process. And, um, and in the process of that, uh, they have sought God's uh, direction to make changes in their life. And, and those, those are on our website uh, if, if you are, are interested. Each sermon, whether it be on Sunday mornings or whether it be on Wednesdays, what, uh, what John and I have tried to do is to address some of the major struggles that exist with us. Uh, for instance, how our faith and our body is tied together. Um, so we looked, at the, the, we looked at Daniel in the Old Testament. Uh, we looked at Gideon and the idea of just coming to the conclusion that uh, things can change, that there's the possibility that with God's help, our life can change. Uh, last week, we looked at Jacob and the temptation that we have uh, with, with, uh, with, with having control, control over other people, control over things in our life, and, and, and Jacob as an example of giving up control and, and what that would look like. Uh, what, it, what it looked like for him and what it would look like uh, for us. On Wednesday nights, we looked at Ananias. The, uh, Ananias uh, is really, when we find Ananias just from one page to the next, he, he's a bit player, at least it seems like he is, in the life of Paul, but was very pivotal in the very beginning of Paul's uh, faith life in connecting the dots of, uh, of, this, of what's going on inside of his life. And, and for Ananias, it was overcoming fear. I mean, Paul at that time had a very nasty reputation, and, and Ananias, there's this part in, in the book of Acts where Ananias is having this conversation with God, and it's, it, it, it is solely with Ananias and, and overcoming fear in order to, to live into something differently with him and with Paul. Now today, I want us to look at the concept of forgiveness. Now if you were to ask me what's... Uh, What's the, the, the giant in the room that plagues the majority of us or plagues the church today? I would say it is this concept of forgiveness. Receiving forgiveness, granting forgiveness. And Philemon, though not a letter specifically about forgiveness, as if Paul teaches on forgiveness, this whole concept of forgiveness is intricately woven into every word inside the letter. 
But with any scripture, context is important. Whenever we read scripture, we want to inter- interpret scripture, we, we want to understand the situation uh, that, that, that involves the, the, the text itself. And so what this is, this is Paul, Paul wrote a personal letter to Philemon. The fact that we have this uh, is incredible to me. Because the other letters that Paul writes in the New Testament, he writes to a group of people, maybe to uh, a church that he's visited, like, uh, like Corinth, maybe to a place he wants to visit, like Rome. And so he, he's writing this corporate letter to a group of people. That's not Philemon. If, if Paul was living today, this would be a private email that he sends to Philemon. And what we know about this is that he is, uh, it's addressed to Philemon, who is a very wealthy man, and at some point in their history together, they meet in Ephesus. Now, Paul, maybe he was on a preaching tour. We know that he took uh, missionary journeys, uh, a number of journeys uh, early uh, in his ministry. And so maybe Paul is preaching at uh, the First Methodist Church in Ephesus, and it just happens to be that Philemon is there on business, and, and he gets invited to a revival service, and, and Paul's the preacher, and he hears Paul talk about the love of God and, and the grace of Jesus Christ. We, we don't know how it took place. But we know the net effect. Somehow they strike up a relationship And because of Paul's influence on Philemon's life, Philemon becomes a believer in Jesus Christ, a follower, a Christian. We don't know how long they were together in Ephesus. We know that it was at least for for a period of time. But at some point, then Philemon has to return back to his home in Colossae, and Paul continues on on his missionary journeys. At some point in the future, in a different city, not Ephesus, now in Rome, and Paul is under house arrest, so it's getting near the end of his life, he meets another person, another man, whose name is Onesimus. And uh, and Onesimus, like Philemon, under the influence of Paul, becomes a follower of Jesus as well, becomes a Christian. Now, what we do know about Onesimus we get some of his background. We do know that Onesimus was once a slave. Slavery in any area is an ugly institution. But in the Roman Empire, it was particularly brutal. It is estimated that uh, throughout the, uh, the, the Roman Empire, there were about 60 million slaves, uh, which was about half of the population. And it turns out that Onesimus was once a slave to Philemon. So there you have the connection. But at some point in Philemon and Onesimus' history, Onesimus escaped. We don't know the conditions behind that. Uh, I can only surmise that if I was Onesimus, I would have wanted to have escaped as well. Maybe it was in a time of confession when Onesimus was in Rome with with Paul that he talks about his history. Maybe it was common knowledge. That we do not know. We just know of the background about who Onesimus was and at the same time what his connection was to Philemon. But nonetheless, Paul hears about the history of Onesimus. And what what he wrote to Philemon is that he's writing to Philemon about Onesimus and their history together. Now here's what he writes. Onesimus, what he tells Philemon is that both that Onesimus has been helpful to him or he, Paul, and at the same time he's been help, he, he was helpful uh, to Philemon but can be, can be more helpful if he would receive him a certain way. Though slavery might be abolished in our country, at least for some time, we all live with different types of bondage. And bitterness and forgiveness can be very destructive in the life of relationships. So here are the two things I want you to get this morning when it comes to forgiveness and how that works inside of our own life. There is never any reconciliation. There will be no reconciliation without forgiveness. Forgiveness with God, nor with another person. And I think what Paul instructs Philemon to consider is worth considering for us, 
particularly when we find ourselves in situations where there's a struggle with forgiving, either receiving forgiveness from someone or granting forgiveness. And the first thing we know of what Paul, how he, uh, uh, of his appeal to Philemon is that he said this. He said, Philemon, on the basis of love, I want you to consider something. Now, not love that Philemon had for Onesimus or love that Onesimus had for Philemon. If we had to guess, there probably were none. But the love that both of them have for Paul. Paul's love for Philemon and and Philemon's love for Paul and then Paul's love for, for Onesimus. That is crucial for when it comes to forgiveness. What would your life be like if you didn't focus on the other person, particularly when the relationship is broken, but only on God's love for you, would that change things? See, often whenever our relationships are broken, where there's bitterness that takes place, normally it's tied to an experience, an experience between one person and another, that relationship is broken, and what happens is we get stuck with just focusing on the other person. What Paul instructs Philemon to do is don't worry about Onesimus just yet. You focus just on our love. So what would your life be like if you focused on the love of God and you just stayed there for a while? Not worry about the other person. We'll get to that at some point but strictly in just the relationship that exists between you and God. Here's what I've I've discovered about my own life. If I focus on the other person, there's never forgiveness. Don't have the ability to do it. But if I focus on God's love for me, what I become aware of are all the ways that in my past, sometimes even in the present, and I can promise you in the future where I'm going to get it wrong. I'm either going to say something, do something, or think something that I know is destructive to me, destructive to my relationship with God. And in spite of all of that, he still loves me. Not worried about another person. I'll get to that at some point in the future. But when it comes to forgiveness, and this is what Paul is instructing Philemon to do, don't worry about Onesimus. We'll get to that in a moment. Start with just God's love for you. And stay there as long as you need. I don't think I'm alone when it comes to past, present, and future of either violations or ways that I can hurt a relationship. Now, if you want to talk about in terms of sins, issues, problems, really don't care what word you want to place on that. I know I've got them, and I know you do too. So the issue is not the other, relation, the other person in the relationship, the issue in the beginning is just God's love of me. And I can, to stay there as long as it takes to when it comes to the other person, I'm not worried about it. I mean, what would your life be like if you set, and it could be years, okay? I'm not talking about a day, I'm not talking about a couple of minutes or a few hours, or I mean, but, but to stay there for a season of your life to where in spite of any issues, any brokenness, any dysfunction that we might have when it comes to another person, that I would just focus in on God's love to the point to where when I think about the other person, it pales in comparison. So it has to start first with God's love of you and God's love of me. 
Paul writes to Philemon before he even gets to Onesimus. He talks about, I want you just to think about the love that, we, that, that exists between both of us when it comes to our faith. Can we not just start there too when it comes to forgiveness? What happens, if you can imagine, when, when we focus on, on the other person, then it's, it's like holding a glass that's always empty. And so then when we're asked to forgive, we can't because inside the glass, it's emptiness. But by staying in just God's love for me or God's love for you, then what happens through the work of God's spirit, that glass becomes full. And so then it just spills out over into other people's lives so that then if there is and when there will be a broken relationship, it's not as important as what it was when the glass was empty. But if you start with just you and the other person, there will be no forgiveness and there will never be any reconciliation. Because if you could do that on your own, why would it even be a problem in the first place? So it has to start in a source that's greater than ourselves. God's love for me or God's love for you. Stay there as long as, as long as you need. At some point, Paul goes on to write to Philemon and says, I'm going to appeal to you on the basis of love. I'm not going to try to force it. I, I, just, I want you to think about the love that exists between, uh, between uh, Paul and Philemon. Not worried about Onesimus, but now when it gets to Onesimus, this is what I want you to do. Because of the love that is shared between Paul and Philemon, and what I would say is the love that, that exists and is shared between God and, and, and who we are. I want you then to receive me as you would receive me, receive him. There's no way in the world Philemon could do that if he didn't start with a greater source, the love that he and Paul shared for each other. As you would receive Jesus, receive another person. I mean, what would it look like if I would replace other people in my lives, at least where there's broken relationships or strained relationships, or there's the beginnings of bitterness or unforgiveness? What if I were to replace that person and, and treat that person, receive that person as if that person was Jesus? And we're not saying that they are Jesus. They'll never be Jesus, just like we'll never be Jesus. But what if I treated them as such? began to see them that way. Then the bitterness that I hold on to, the unforgiveness that exists inside of that relationship, well, my cup is already full from the love of God. It's amazing how that stuff just pales in comparison. It cannot happen. It will not happen if we think that what exists inside of us is this ability to let those past experiences that have such a hold over our life, to let them go, does not exist. But now if you see it and start first with God's love of you and you allow that to be the base of your identity, did you hear the prayer that we pray for the children every Sunday? It's the same one. We want them as they grow up to see themselves anchored in the love of God. So whenever there's any level of, of defect, any level of struggle, and, that, and, and, and then the opportunity or the temptation then exists for them to move in a different direction, they'll be anchored there. Well, if you're whole, you don't need anything else. And if you find a, if through the work of the Spirit, you, the, the, trend, the nature of Christ becomes formed inside the life of the person to how they see themselves is they perceive wholeness. 
Well, if you're whole, you can let other stuff go. It just pales in comparison. I don't know if that's your one thing. It might be something completely different. If I had to guess, there's some in the room, it's forgiveness. Granting forgiveness to another person, receiving forgiveness. Communion is all about forgiveness. It doesn't matter what denomination, it doesn't matter how, whether we use liturgy or don't use liturgy, the, the, the act of communion is about receiving and giving forgiveness. And so I invite you to prepare your hearts to receive a sacrament that is, is solely uh, about this one concept of forgiveness. And so listen to the way the liturgy reads. It's on page 12 in your hymnal. The invitation is this. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. To say it differently, therefore, let us consider God's love for us. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law and we have rebelled against your love. And we have not loved our neighbors and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now hear the good news of how God loves you. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory, Glory to God. God. Amen. And now the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, he gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by His blood. By Your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at His heavenly banquet. Through Your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and Your Holy Church, all honor and glory is Yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen.
morning uh, through intention, uh, which means that you'll come forward, you'll be given a piece of uh, bread, go ahead and dip it in the cup, and then partake of it. Um, normally our history is for us to enter in from the outsides, but since our uh, arrangements, it's different. We're going to actually come down the center aisle, you'll receive, uh, receive the elements, and then you can return to your seats through the outside portion, just return in the spirit of prayer uh, for those who are receiving. We'll invite the uh, ushers, and then after the ushers, the choir. down the center aisle and then return uh, on the outside.
books and turn with me to hymn number 368. My hope is built. I invite you to stand as you're able as we sing the first, the second, the last of 368. My hope is built. to receive this benediction.